morning, everybody, and thanks, Phil, for that lovely introduction. Um, and we're delighted that we gave you bragging rights within Canada for having and hosting the first um, management board meeting of a joint programming initiative in Canada. And we were delighted to be here. And I'm delighted that I have all my colleagues around me as well, because they can help me answer and feel some of the questions that you may have. But over the next 25, 30 minutes or so, I'm going to give you an understanding, hopefully, of what the joint programming initiative, A Healthy Diet for a Healthy Life, is. But before I do that, I did read the material that Ashley had sent around in advance of the um, in advance of the workshop, just to understand the kind of context within which you're operating. And as you know, the uh, objectives of the workshop were threefold. They were about aligning food, nutrition, and agricultural research agendas, encouraging greater collaboration and research on the impact of diet and lifestyle on health and its connection with agriculture. And thirdly, support a culture of international collaboration and alignment in support of the Food for Health agenda and translation of that research. And I hope by the time you come to, I come to the end of the presentation, you'll get an understanding of the fact that, in fact, the JPI is going some way to achieving some of these objectives. Not all, but some. And then I took a look at some of the key messages from your pre-workshop survey, and thanks to David, because he took you through them in a lot more detail. But there were four um, main areas. And indeed, there were a number of things that came through from those four main areas. And I hope over the next 25 minutes or so, I'm going to give you a little bit of an understanding of how the JPI Healthy Diet for Healthy Life may address some of these issues. They may, Dan, you may from the presentation identify some of the opportunities. But in fact, the JPI has been working for a considerable length of time for about the last six years. And we've battled with some of these challenges. And we've created a huge amount of opportunities as well as the fact that we have identified some real key research areas that have to be addressed in order to provide solutions to some of these grand societal challenges that we're facing globally. Core, though, to every public-public partnership or every public-private partnership is trust. Absolutely critical to the success and the sustainability of any partnership is trust between those who are sitting around the table. And for anybody entering into a partnership, I certainly wouldn't underestimate the time it takes to build trustful relationships with those you are speaking to and working with around your table. Because I have to say, at the very, very beginning, the JPI was very disparate, very fragmented. But in fact, now, after six years, we have really come to a point where we do trust one another around the table. And we do understand the differences between the various different actors within the system, and indeed the different cultures that are there within the European countries that are involved. And cultural partnership or cultural issues was one of the things that came through from your stakeholder um, survey. And it's interesting. In Europe, we have, um, I suppose, we're exposed to that cultural diversity on a regular basis when we're dealing with policy development at a European level because we have 28 countries, 28 member states within the European Union. Indeed, there are about 23, 24 European countries involved in the JPI, and then we also have, and we'd like to call you Canada rather than just a third country. We have Canada and New Zealand involved in the JPI, which is fantastic for us because it brings a much better flavor of the kind of challenges, the opportunities, etc., that we can tap into then in order to develop some solutions. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the background to the JPI because I think this is really important in terms of understanding what we're doing and how we're going to do it and, and how we have been operating up until now but how we will continue to operate into the future. And joint programming represents a significant change in approaching the integration of European research. It focuses on and acts to mobilize public funding in seeking solutions to major challenges that affect society as a whole and not only for strengthening the European economic competitiveness, but really providing some solutions into those public health issues that we're all grappling with. The Joint Programming Initiative Healthy Diet for Healthy Life is in the field of nutrition, food and health, and provides for the coordination of research on the impact of diet and lifestyles on health. And we hope that it will contribute significantly to the construction of what we're calling in Europe a fully operational European research area on the prevention of diet-related diseases. But I suppose when we started off on this journey back in 2008, 2009, 
we were very much focused on what was going on in Europe and bringing people together in Europe, bringing research organizations together in Europe. But in fact, we very quickly realized that in order for us to really work collaboratively and to address this global societal challenge, we needed to involve and we sought out and uh, looked for um, additional countries to come in and support us. And indeed, we continue to look for countries who will come in and join the JPI. But we were delighted that Canada was the first full member outside the European Union who joined the JPI Management Board, and then New Zealand, who had been an observer country on the Management Board, then became a full member last year. But what is joint programming? It is a true public-public partnership. But the research that it funds and it coordinates facilitates public-private partnerships as well. And you're going to hear about one of those specifically from the next speaker, from Edith Feskins, who's the Vice Chair of the Scientific Advisory Board, and she'll talk you through one of the research activities that we have funded through the JPI to give you an understanding of how these things operate at a, very, at a research level. But effectively what it is, is member states are member countries working together to tackle major societal challenges more effectively. That is it in its simplest form. It is about countries coming together voluntarily to coordinate their research programs to contribute to um, the, the solutions for grand society, to solve grand societal challenges. One would wonder why would you do joint programming? Surely be to God when you think about it, bringing a number of countries together, trying to coordinate research programs that's hugely complex in a very complex area, but also with all of these issues around cultural diversity, um, language barriers, uh, different research programs at national levels, different policies, different structures, different funding instruments, etc. Why would you do it? Why would you even embark on such a journey? But it really is about coordination of food and health research programs across Europe and beyond, thereby reducing duplication of effort. It's also about an ability to address common societal challenges together. And it's about promotion of scientific excellence through joint activities, thereby increasing the scientific, technological and innovative impacts of public investments. It is about supporting cross-border collaboration and the facilitation of data pooling and their collection in a uniform and standardized way in order to make best use of that data. And most importantly, it's about the creation of critical mass allowing cross-border mobility and training to facilitate timely dissemination and translation of research results. And those are very laudable, um, um, ambitious um, targets that we face, but we wonder, well, what will we get out of all of this in the end? And what are the outputs and the outcomes? And we believe that there will be products, new products on the shelves for consumers to choose, healthy products. There will be policies and programs that will be underpinned by evidence. There will be new tools available for monitoring impact of diet, etc., and other tools that might be available. Indeed, hopefully, they will deliver a number of um, new services to consumers. So how does the JPI operate? And this is important in, the, in understanding public, well, in, in understanding partnerships in general, but specifically with respect to the JPI where it's a public, public partnership. There has to be a fit for purpose governance structure. These are the countries that are involved in the JPI as it stands. We are an open initiative, so we're not exclusive to just the countries we have around the table. And it is important, though, and that you are looking to become involved in a JPI, that you are willing to really participate, because it is only by the participation of the individuals around the table that we get the real impact um, from the effort that's invested. Because many, in fact, all of the member states around the table of the management board do so voluntarily. Their country supports their travel, their subsistence, and their engagement in the joint programming related activities. This is how we're structured. We have a management board, so I'm the chair of the management board and the vice chair of the management board, Martin Shabakar, who's here also. And we have a steering committee which supports the management board, and the steering committee is made up of myself, the vice chair, and two members of the management board. And really what we do in the steering committee is, to, is um, prepare for the management board meetings, and we have about three or four of those a year. We are supported by a secretariat and the coordinator of the project, and the secretariat is Jolene Venick, and she's also here. 
And the Secretariat is funded very importantly by the European Commission, who provided us €2 million Euro over a period of three years to pull all of this together, to support the administration and um, activities of the Management Board, and indeed the other two advisory boards, very importantly, the Scientific Advisory Board and the Stakeholder Advisory Board. And then what you see at the end of this slide are some task forces, and these are transient group, are group working groups that are set up in order to address specific issues. So we have one on determinants of diet and physical activity. We had one on nutritional and health biomarkers. We had a phenotype data sharing task force. And we also had a task force looking at IPR and open access. And we have published a lot of information on some of these areas, and they are all available on our website, free for you to download. And indeed, also, there's a lot of other publications on the website that we have generated over the last number of years. And we will continue to generate publications and position papers. These are the faces of the 15 scientists who help us within the Joint Programming Initiative Management Board. Uh, they're all from Europe at the moment. Um, that's not to say that the next um, members of the Management Board, when we do have new members coming on board, that they couldn't be from the other countries who were involved in the JPI. And Edith Feskins, who is here, is the, as I said, is the Vice Chair. Um, and she is, and if I can get the pointer, this lady here, uh, currently um, and just taken over recently, the chair of the Scientific Advisory Board is Professor Helen Roach from University College Dublin in Ireland. Previously, the Scientific Advisory Board was under the chairmanship of Professor Hanelor Daniel from Germany. These are the stakeholder advisory board members, um, and you'll see that we, uh, apologies, um, you see that we have ILSI Europe is a member of our stakeholder advisory board, as indeed are many of the European organizations and associations. There are 15 members on the stakeholder advisory board, five that align to each of the research pillars, which I'll explain to you in a moment within the um, JPI. So every initiative has to have a vision. They have to have a belief in what they can achieve, what is possible. And the vision of the JPI is that in 2030, all citizens will have the motivation, ability, and opportunity to consume a healthy diet from a variety of foods, have healthy levels of physical activity, and the incidence of diet-related diseases will have decreased significantly. And of course, no initiative can deliver on this vision alone. We do need to work in partnership with others. We need to work with our, in partnership around the management board table. But indeed, we also need to work in partnership with our stakeholders. And we've just had our management board meeting here in Ottawa, or in Ottawa for the last two days. And indeed, a lot of our discussion was around who are the stakeholders? Who do we have to communicate? Who, do, who should we communicate in order to make sure that we can achieve this vision? And having identified and, and clarified and, and defined a vision for the JPI back in around 2010, which we updated recently actually to reflect the fact that we now have Canada and New Zealand as members of our management board. Originally it was focused on European citizens, but obviously that was quite inclusive or I suppose exclusive of the, um, of the, the Canadian and uh, New Zealand population. So we amended our vision to look at all citizens. The strategic research agenda was the first document that the Joint Programming Initiative Management Board put together, and it really sets out what we believe is our strategy for the next number of years. It was published in 2012, and it was launched at the first Joint Programming Conference, which was held in Den Haag. Um, it was an international conference, and it was signed by all members of the Management Board. It was signed and endorsed by the Scientific Advisory Board and the Stakeholder Advisory Board. And this is important that all members of the, state, of the, the uh, Management Board sign the, um, the strategic research agenda because effectively then what it did was created a commitment. And commitment in partnerships is incredibly important because if you don't have that commitment, you don't really have a true sustainable partnership into the future. There are three research areas within the strategic research agenda. We have uh, broken the complex area down into three main pillars. The first is determinants of diet and physical activity, subtitled ensuring the healthy choice is the easy choice. The second pillar is diet and food production, subtitled Developing Healthy, High Quality, Safe and Sustainable Foods. And the third research area is diet and chronic disease, preventing diet-related chronic diseases and increasing the quality of life. The reason we broke it down into three pillars was because it was incredibly complex. It is an incredibly complex area for us to deal with in one. 
And so by breaking it down into three research areas, we felt this was a lot more manageable. It also created opportunities to bring together researchers within the different fields within each of the different pillars. For example, bringing nutritional scientists together with physical activity scientists. And whilst this may seem simple on paper, in fact, in reality, it is quite difficult to bring two different scientific groups together who have a very different language. So again, initially, it is about having the same or at least an understanding of one another. It is then about developing trustful relationships whereby you can work together in specific research areas on specific research topics. But of course, there will come a point where we're going to have to join all of this up. Because indeed, it's not going to be just about generating outputs and outcomes from each of these three pillars. The benefit and the impact is really going to come from when we start to bring all of this together to deliver solutions to these grants, this grant societal challenge. Every strategic research agenda has to be considered in the context of the changing environment. And so recently, in fact last year, we uh, published the second edition of the strategic research agenda because things move quickly in research. They also move quickly in, in, uh, in the policy area as well. So again, our second edition of the strategic research agenda was um, signed up, uh, signed off by all members of the uh, management board. It was informed again by the scientific advisory board and the stakeholder advisory board, but also it was informed by a foresight study which we had taken, undertaken um, over a couple of years. And indeed that foresight study is available again to download from the website. And of course every strategy has to have an implementation plan. We're not interested in just having something that generates or gathers dust on the shelf. It is really about, well, what are we going to do? So we started back in 2012, really, with some pilot activities. Um, but um, And they really set the context, they set the tone, they set a little bit of an understanding of how we could work together. But they were really pilot activities. But in fact, they became very substantial joint actions and joint research activities within the context of the JPI. And so we stopped referring them to as pilot initiatives because they actually became quite um, large initiatives. But following on from the publication of the Strategic Research Agenda, we developed our first implementation plan, which covered the two years, 2014, 2015. And again, this is available to download on our website. And it set out what we were going to do over that two-year period. And it was structured around five key areas. One was the alignment of national research policies and programs. It was about strategic collaboration, communication, joint activities, and underpinning sectoral policies. And there's substantial text under, under, under all of these uh, key areas. And indeed, um, a very, very, I think, point you to um, having a look at that to see the kind of context within which we operate. Most importantly, though, within the Joint Programming Initiative is around the alignment of research policies. And you talked in your stakeholder feedback about the alignment of agendas. And how do you bring different agendas together? How do you align them to move forward to do something that would be impactful? And we have a number of countries, as you know, around the table in the management board, and they all have their own agendas. And what we've been trying to do over the last number of years is align some of those agendas. So in some respects, we've had the strategic research agenda by the JPI published, and that has informed and influenced national research agendas in the area of food, nutrition, diet, and health. Or indeed, the other side, the, the converse has also happened, where national research agendas have influenced the strategic research agenda of the JPI. We hope there will come a point over the next number of years where every country sitting around the table within the JPI will effectively align to the strategic research agenda of the JPI. But we've got to recognize the diversity within the management board and the diversity within the uh, different countries who sit around the table, their different national programs, the way in which they fund research, etc. But what we have got to do is come to a point where we have at least some standardized approach about how we do things together. Because it's only by having a standardized approach again that we can ensure that we're funding excellent research and that we're delivering solutions. So this is a, a slide really that just looks a little bit about how, we're, how we think about alignment in, in Europe. And it's about, there are other JPIs, so there are nine other joint programming initiatives that have kicked off over the last number of years. Some of them are in areas of interest to us. So there's one on food security, agriculture, and climate change. And we're working very closely with that joint programming initiative in the area of food and nutrition security. We've also talked to the joint programming initiative on oceans in the context of food and nutrition security. We're also conversing constantly with the joint programming initiative 
initiative on um, more years, better lives, and we're also cognizant of some of the other activities of the other JPIs around, for example, antimicrobial resistance. So one of the things we did very early on was we brought all of these initiatives, so the JPIs, the European Technology Platforms, the European Innovation Partnerships, the ERINETs, if anybody who knows Europe will know we're brilliant for acronyms. And in fact, we spent two days, or the last two days, making sure that our Canadian colleagues actually understood what all of these are. So ETPs are European technology platforms. They're industry-led technology platforms that have been set up and supported by the European Commission, but very much with the focus of understanding what are the research needs of industry. European Innovation Partnerships are another partnership type approach and they're public-public partnerships again, but can involve some private involvement at a more local level. Again, a lot of information on the website and I won't go through it here. ERINETs are European Research Area Networks, um, an instrument that funds uh, networking within by the European Commission. And then there are a number of projects that have been funded over the last number of years. For example, Eurodish, which is a project that looks at um, infrastructures within the whole nutrition and health area. And then there are many international activities. In fact, one of the things we talked about over the last couple of days is actually mapping the entire, excuse me, ecosystem of activities and initiatives in this space in order to get a better understanding of where we can align with some of the activities of those and where we can avoid duplication, but also where we can get some synergy and complementarity. And of course, as I said, the last implementation plan finished at the end of 2015, and we've been working really, really hard on putting together the second implementation plan, which we actually just published recently, again, available to download from our website. And this year, we decided to, or this time, we decided to run the implementation plan over a three-year period. And the rationale behind that is because it takes time to get some of these research initiatives up and running. It also takes time to get some of the non-research activities that we're involved in moving forward to develop some impact. And indeed, all also, the European Commission is at the moment thinking about what is the next framework program after Horizon 2020. And we know that in 2018 they're going to come looking for insight and um, input into what that program might look like and we'd like to make, so make sure that we're in a position to provide that kind of input into that discussion. Within this second implementation plan, we have defined three objectives. The first is scientific and evidence-based recommendations for policy. We hear about the need for evidence-based policy everywhere we go, and I think anybody in this room will have heard that phrase and terminology used many, many, many times. The challenge, though, is how do you translate that evidence into policy? Can policymakers take that evidence and use it to inform policy? Can policymakers inform what kind of evidence is needed in order to um, provide the the, the types of policies that we're going to need into the future. And indeed, this area around evidence-based policies was also something that came up in our foresight study, which identified the need for integrated policy making, looking at how you develop policies and making sure that if you're not going to develop one big policy to cover all areas, but indeed that you need to make sure that your agricultural policy is cognizant of your public health policy, and indeed your industrial policy and research policy also need to be considered within that context as well. The second objective is around research leadership. We want to make sure that we're funding the best research with the best scientists and they're doing the right things in order to make sure we're providing the right kind of outputs that can be translated into outcomes which generate some impact. We want to be the best and we want to fund the best and that can only be facilitated by having the best scientists working for us. Partnerships are critical to, to, to um, the, the success and the sustainability of the JPI. As I said, our vision is not something that we're going to deliver alone. It's something that we have to deliver in partnership with others. And what we've set ourselves is some key performance indicators um, that will help us to make sure that we continue to progress towards things that are, are useful and that provide some impact. And I'm just going to briefly go through what I mean by national alignment. So we have a number of activities that we've identified about how we're going to bring countries, um, we're going to align countries at a national level. One of the things we did in, our, in the, the last couple of years was we had a meeting of all of the funding bodies, and this is something that doesn't generally happen. So we brought all of the funding bodies with interest in the area of food, nutrition, diet and health together at a meeting in Switzerland. And indeed, that was really interesting because we picked up on some funding agencies that we didn't even know existed or had an interest in our activities. And in fact, now this has provided us with another opportunity to develop partnerships with those, for example, charitable type organizations who have an interest in um, food and nutrition. 
Relationships with ministries of health are critical and what we find in Europe is that some of the members around the table are actually members of ministries of agriculture and food. Others are, but very limited, are from ministries of health and others are also from ministries of research science. Others are from funding agencies and others are actually scientists, senior scientists within research organisations. Uh, th this cre creates a very, very interesting and dynamic discussion but it also creates some challenges because there needs to be connectivity between the ministries. Um, in terms of the policy making and specifically we need to make sure that our relationships with our ministries of health are much stronger. I'm not too sure what it's like in Canada. I can only speak for, for Europe and I can only speak really for Ireland um, where I used to work for the Ministry of Agriculture, Food and the Marine and we had a fairly uh, interesting relationship with our Ministry of Health and now the organisation that I lead the Food Safety Authority actually reports into the Ministry of Health and I'm seeing it now from the other side but there is a lack of connectedness between Ministries of Health and Ministries of Agriculture and the contribution that food production, manufacturing and processing can make to public health and I think there needs to be that uh, connection, there needs to be that dialogue to make sure that the policies are as I said earlier on, are cognizant of the, of the challenges on both sides, but also are cognizant of the need to make sure that what we're doing is good for, for, for our public. We're talking about a toolkit for the development of national alignment, and we're talking about targeted communication materials. Again, these are just some of the areas that we're going to be working on over the next number of years. With respect to European alignment, and as I said earlier on, we've been talking quite at length over the last couple of days around stakeholders, and we have, as you saw, 15 stakeholders around the table, but there are many, 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 many more. And one of the things we're going to do is hold or set up a stakeholder forum where we can engage with the multiplicity of stakeholders within the system and try and understand how we can gather input from those stakeholders and use that input to influence and inform what we do. We need to look again at uh, other related initiatives um, around partnerships, etc. We need to have a very, very good and strong and robust dialogue with the European Commission. And I'm delighted to say that that's developing. It hasn't always been there because joint programming was very much initiated by the European member states on their own. And it was supported by the Commission. What's interesting now is that we're needing to, and we're, we're, the dialogue is opening up between ourselves as a serious stakeholder of the European Commission in their thinking into the future. Um, and over the next number of months, they will be developing a new food strategy, which is going to be called, we understand, Food 2030. And that will be launched on the 13th of October by, um, as I understand it, three uh, European Commissioners, the Commissioner for Agriculture, the Commissioner for Health and the Commissioner for Research. And this I think is the first I've ever seen where three Commissioners in Agriculture, Health and Research have actually come together in order to uh, co-launch a specific initiative around food and nutrition. International alignment is about looking at how we interact with third countries. And so we have obviously great experience in working with Canada, and Canada are involved in a number of our projects. Um, and indeed, we also have a great experience in working with New Zealand. But we need to clearly look at who are the third countries who we need to work with into the future in order to be able to provide the solutions to these, uh, this grand challenge. Um, so these are just a, a flavor of what we're going to be doing over the course of this implementation plan. And then we're also looking at how we can engage more maybe international stakeholders into our stakeholder forum. So again, it is watch this space, but we'll continue to communicate. Obviously, we have Mary Jo, who's on our management board, and Phil was with us for the last couple of days, and we're delighted to have that engagement, and we'll continue to communicate and disseminate through our website, and perhaps there may be some more targeted communication activities specifically focused on, on Canada. What have we been doing for the last six years? And I suppose this is where it gets really interesting from a scientific perspective. What research have we been funding? And I'm only going to give you a very, very quick flavor because you're going to have the, um, a much more deeper understanding of how one of these research activities works at a much more detailed level um, in a moment. But we have um, a number of activities that have been kicked off um, aligned to our three research pillars. And you can see them there. We have um, one on the first pillar, which is determinants of diet and physical activity, it's called DEDIPAC. 
Um, uh, 17 million euro, 47 partners, 12 member states, quite a significant investment and that's actually coming to the end of its period now and we're looking to see what are we going to do next with that initiative. So having made that initial investment, we now need to understand how we can add value to that initial investment and grow that critical mass that I spoke about at the beginning. Um, in relation to the second research pillar, uh, we have food ball and mirror diet and you're going to hear about food ball in a moment. And then we also have a significant research um, investment in the area of data to sharing in nutritional phenotype. And what was really interesting, and whilst this might not be a huge amount of money, in fact what was really complex is how do you bring data sets from different European countries and different countries together in a way that they can communicate with one another for you to be able to then interrogate that data set and ask it questions, critical questions, um, in a way that makes sense. And in fact, setting up this open access research infrastructure was quite challenging because there is a number of research infrastructures there, and indeed there needs to be a lot more investment in the area. These are some uh, more recent joint actions that we've gotten involved in Pro Health, which looks at um, positive health effects and pelagic fish products. Uh, we have Long Life, which looks around food fermentation, and then we have six research consortia that have just been funded in the area of intestinal microbiomics. And uh, This is a really, really exciting area of research. It's one I've been following for quite a considerable length of time, and I'm very proud that one of the leading research communities in this space is from Ireland. Um, but indeed, there are many, many, many more research activities in this space, and in fact, Brussels has just been talking about the plant microbiome, the marine microbiome, the soil microbiome, the um, human microbiome, and whatever other microbiome there might be out there. Uh, I spent three days in Brussels talking about the microbiome, and I think by the end of it I realized the microbiome is really, really important. And it will be incredibly important into the future. And we do believe that the European Commission is going to make making a significant investment in this area in the coming uh, work programs under either Horizon 2020 or beyond. And indeed, in the final research pillar, then, we have two major um, areas of investment. We have one around malnutrition in the elderly, which, elderly, which is a critical research activity and a critical area and also nutrition in the area of cognition. And we funded a number of projects in both of these areas. But what, well, it's five projects in NutriCog and uh, one specific uh, project in the area of malnutrition in, in the elderly. And interestingly enough, the European Commission have also just launched a, and funded a project in the area of malnutrition. And we've challenged the Commission and we've said, OK, well, you're talking to us about making sure we align. So now can we align with what you're doing, please, and make sure that we're connecting those two different research activities into the future. And in fact, the first one of the first activities between these two projects, once they've kicked off, is a workshop bringing together the researchers who are funded in the research that's funded by the European Commission and indeed the research project that's been funded by ourselves. So these are effectively, uh, it's an overview of the number of joint activities that we have already ongoing in each of the research pillars. And finally then we have um, just received funding for a near net co-fund in the European research area Healthy Diet for a Healthy Life, which involves 19 funding organisations from 12 countries, one associated country and also Canada as well. And effectively what this is, is providing an overarching framework within which a number of joint activities can be funded into the future. I'm not an expert on the detail and how these things work. There are people around this room who know an awful lot more. They're really, really interesting inter instruments and it's really about bringing people together and supporting um, collaborations and partnerships. And of course, what are we going to do into the future? And we've identified a number of research activities within our implementation plan, and we've divided them up into those areas where we're going to invest in, and then into other areas where we're going to explore, possibly leading to an investment. And then there are things that are ongoing, and I'm not going to go through um, any, any of them in any detail at all, because it's again laid out in the implementation plan. But I'd just like you to, to draw your attention to this one here, which is about food and nutrition security. And I know Cathy's going to speak about food and nutrition security today. And this is a really interesting area. And so the narrative really in Europe, and I'm sure globally, has been about food security. It's been about producing enough food to feed the world. It hasn't been about making sure that the quality of that food sustains the nutritional requirements of the growing population that we will have on this planet um, by 2050. So we started a conversation with our JPI FATCHA colleagues and our JPI Oceans colleagues to make sure that we're connecting that food security piece and the nutrition piece. And indeed now the conversation has actually moved on and I'm delighted to see that it's moved on into the area of making sure of safety. 
So we're not just producing enough food, we're making sure that it's of a high quality and that it's safe. There's not much point in producing enough food if it's of bad quality and it is unsafe. Um, so this is a really, really interesting area and it's one that the European Commission, again, is incredibly interested in. Um, and again, it's supported by a number of European commissioners. Uh, we're looking at possibly doing an air, um, a co-funded call in the area of epigenetics into the future, but that's something a little bit further on, probably around 2017, 2019. And again, we're looking at putting together small working groups that are going to explore different areas of interest and perhaps develop position papers or indeed um, um, maybe scoping out some calls that might in, um, we might invest in in the future. But again, bringing it all together, it's about data sharing and it's about standardization and it's about building on the existing initiatives that we have. And I keep challenging the members of the management board and we had a substantial discussion over the last couple of days on this. It's okay to make your first initial investment, but how do you add value to that initial investment? How do you build out on that initial investment to make sure that you are creating the critical mass, that you're avoiding duplication? And in fact, we're not leading to fragmentation or further fragmentation of the research community. And of course, infrastructures are going to be critically important. Um, and I'm not again going to go through any major um, detail on any of this, but these are a number of things that we're going to do in the whole data sharing standardization area. And what we're trying to do is make sure that any research that we fund within the JPI Healthy Diet for Healthy Life Joint Actions subscribes to a set of guiding principles around data and data sharing. So what are the outputs to date? I'm not too sure we can actually identify outcomes yet but we can definitely identify some outputs. And these are here, again, these are captured in the implementation plan, but we're, um, we have a following on LinkedIn and Twitter, and we hope that's going to explode through the roof today when you all sign up and follow us on LinkedIn and on Twitter. Um, we have uh, people from 168 countries visiting our website. This, so people are interested in what we're doing. They want to know about what we're doing. And in the context of some of the messages that came back from you in the survey, it's about understanding. It's about knowing what's going on, and it's about understanding how you can interact with that. And you can get our newsletter. You can register for our newsletter um, on the JPI website, and then you can get updated information on a regular basis from us. And Anna Maria, who leads the communication work package um, within the, um, the the, the, uh, the Secretariat or the, the Coordination Support Action Project is here as well, so you can get some more information. Number of joint actions, in fact, the number has gone up. 20 million is only an estimate. In fact, it's gone up to 50 million already over the last couple of months. Uh, about 20,000 or 29,000 unique visitors during the last year. So you'll see that we're starting to interact and engage with multiple actors uh, across multiple different countries in multiple different areas, and we hope that that's going to grow. But of course, that challenges us within the JPIs. How do we manage all of that growth? How do we manage all of that interaction? I believe this is what we really looked like at the beginning. We were all literally sitting at the table, but none of us were talking to one another. We were all effectively stewing our own pot and making our own food. And I hope this is where we are now, which is much more collaborative, working together and trusting one another to deliver some really, really beneficial impacts for consumers and population health. Thank you very much for listening. You're too kind. So it is there, it's in, in, so a number of the research activities that we have in place, um, and we use a number of different types of funding instruments, and within some of them where it is believed that there is a need for training and education that is built into those joint activities. Um, some of the activities involve actually exchange of students as well to have that mutual shared learning, um, but it's not a specific overarching objective, albeit that is incredibly important that as we are training young scientists and we are funding research that we are effectively training young scientists to make sure that they are, are not just working in isolation within their own labs, but they're also working collaboratively and in partnership, and that they develop that skill set 
um, over the course of their involvement within the JPI and we'll continue that to develop that over time because I think it is about that chair transfer of learning and exchange of information. Thank you. Yes. I'm Kathy Wotecki with the U.S. Department of Agriculture. I have a question about the international mapping that you've done. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? And is that report also available? Um, in fact, that's something that we're planning to do. So apologies okay. if I gave the impression that we had done some of it. Well, we have done some of it, but it's not really um, comprehensive as it stands. <laughs> Mapping is quite a difficult activity. It's also very resource intensive. And what we do is when we launch a joint action, we map the as much as we know or can find out about what's going on within the individual countries who are involved in that joint action. And um, because of the fact that when you go into a country and you look for what is the investment in food research, what's the investment in nutrition research, what's the investment in agricultural research, that's a very difficult question for many countries to answer because they don't have the databases. Um, but indeed, that's just at a research level and what's going on in the research community. I think what we need to, we're now going to move into well, what's going on internationally that we need to tap into. And actually, this is really the conversation around who are the stakeholders. And when I talk about stakeholders, they talk about also the initiatives, the various different platforms, so the EU platform on diet and physical activity. Um, we have been engaging with the, uh, we start to engage a little bit more with the OECD. Uh, we're talking with the FAO um, through the con um, within the context of the food and nutrition security piece, and as well as that, we're also involved with the um, dialogue around the, with the WHO. But again, it's around understanding what they're doing and whether there's an opportunity. But what I've found personally, and, and I think we found in the JPI, is that there's so many things going on, and we need to really sit down and look at what's going on and make sure we're not duplicating any of the effort, and that we're actually creating some sort of added value by connecting it with those. So when we have that, I'll definitely let you know. So there's a, a challenge to the to Jolene um, to <laughs> on the international alignment piece, and we'll try and get that out as soon as possible. But we need international countries to help us with that. So folks, if you there are three empty seats sitting here, so uh, please come up if you want to relax. If you want to stand, that's also great. Okay. Wonderful uh, presentation. Uh, very uh, ambitious uh, uh, endeavor. I was just kind of curious if you had any insights in terms of the outputs. Uh, you mentioned uh, uh, potentially services, products, policy. Uh, do you have any examples of those yet? Um, so we have outputs in terms of numbers and papers and research number number of researchers coming together, number of countries involved, number amount of money invested. But they are just outputs at this point in time. They have definitely not been translated into outcomes. Um, we really have only been kind of re investing seriously over the last three years, and we're now starting, and we'll by the end of this year start to see the some serious outputs from the very first investment. Investment. And it goes back to the point of, well, what are we going to do with all of this? Because I think, um, and this is, this is not just an Irish problem or a European problem, it's a global problem. We've been generating really, really, really interesting scientific outputs for many, many, many years. There's been a lot of money going in. But now there's a real need to translate those outputs into outcomes and, in fact, to go further and identify what the impact of those outcomes are going to be, specifically in this area on public health. So watch this space. That's certainly resonates in Canada, right? You know, we need impact on that research. The, the other thing maybe you could just comment a little more about is a national alignment, because that also is a big issue in Canada. The right hand doesn't know what the left hand is doing. So the JPIs are an opportunity to build on those national alignments. Absolutely, and I think this is we we've seen so around the table of the management board, every country that's a member um, can have two representatives. Um, sometimes countries take up that opportunity, other times countries don't. Um, so what we can see, as I said earlier on, is a mix between ministries and research funding organizations and senior researchers within research funding agencies around the table. Um, and what, I've, what, it, what we've been challenging ourselves to do really is to go back into countries and understand who are the research funders within this country that have an interest. And that was the real, um, uh, the, the rationale behind this research funders meeting that we had in Switzerland that I mentioned in passing um, just during the presentation and in fact that created a little bit more of an understanding of who was doing what in certain countries but again it's not um, it's not a complete picture and it's something we're actually going to repeat again towards the end of the year 
for example, I can tell you what's going on in, in Ireland. So when I was a member of the management board of this JPI, I um, back in, I think, between 2010 and 2013, um, I set up a national steering group within Ireland which had representatives from all of the research funding agencies and other stakeholders, industry included, so that when Ireland went to the management board meetings, we were going with an Irish position, not the Ministry of Agriculture's position, which is where I worked, but it was an Irish position. And I think this is important for every country who sits around the table and it's a lesson really, there's no point in just going with the Ministry of Agriculture perspective. You have to go with a position, you have to have had those conversations at national level. See Martenta, the Netherlands have done something similar, but she'll talk a little bit more about that, I'm sure. I think it's a challenge everywhere, and uh, well, as uh, Ireland, we do have a group like that in the Netherlands, uh, it's the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of uh, Economic Affairs. But it's also two public-private uh, partnerships who invest in the JPI who are around the table. Then it's another funder, so we try to align. So when I'm at the table as a management board member, I am there on behalf of the Netherlands. But since it's so complicated, we have an intern right now who works for the JPI and CHL at our office in the Netherlands. And she is interviewing members from the management board on how they align nationally. So that paper will come out sometime, uh, I don't know, in the summer, uh, which will be on our website and we'll talk about uh, national alignment. And she just interviewed Ma from Norway yesterday uh, by phone, because she's not here. Um, so Norway is one of the countries which is interviewed about uh, national alignment. So any interest in that, that will come up on the website in the summer. So I think for the sake of time, we're going to answer questions there. Uh, please join me in thanking you. Um, just thank you, but just just to say that um, Vilka is waving at me from the second row. Um, we have um, a number of these uh, booklets which contain a number of fact sheets which give you a lot more detail around the joint research activities that we funded. We unfortunately don't have one for everybody in the audience. We are trying to save the planet by not printing everything that we produce, but every one of these is downloadable from the website as well, um, and I hope you would go to that website and increase the number of visitors, but also interact with us uh, through the JPI. But if you do want a copy, a physical copy, then Vilka has one.